Let me pray for us, even as we are about to enter into God's word. We thank you, our Father, this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for its truth. We thank you for its transforming power through your spirit. Help us as we look into your word this morning. Help us and open our hearts and our minds. Grant us that even as I speak, there will be simplicity and there will be understanding on the people. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You know, Bazalon, sometimes I don't like talking about where I grew up. Because I, obviously it wasn't bad, man. But I'm not sure if you all grew up in the same area, but even now. Have you grown up next in where you all notice a home where there's just no peace? Where there's just fights. Fights sometimes not just verbally, but also sometimes physically. Where there is uh, lots of reflukere, is the word like that. All it informs or tells us that uh, there's a lack of peace in that home. There's a lack of some working unity in that home. For then it informs us that such a home, there's certain ingredients that are missing in such a home. I lived in, next to such homes, and it wasn't the most wonderful thing. Because it tells you that people, though that they are family, they are all not pulling in one direction. Everyone is pulling in their own direction. And we know that central or core to that is this idea of sin. And normally when we stay, when we know such homes, also a drink would also be a contributing factor too. With that said, it is not dissimilar to where we are still finding ourselves in the book of Exodus. If you're coming or you haven't missed us, we are continuing starting off in Exodus 21 and today we are in Exodus 23. In a sense, what God has done, what God did was to call the children of Israel and when calling them, he was to seeking to mold them into your community. A community that will be what he calls a covenant community, a community that is led by God, but not only led by God, but at the core of their being, having God's covenant as their guiding document. Whilst we are still in 23, what we'll learn also in 24, recall when we started off, I even took you back in last week, that how then God presented to them that he sought to make them into a covenant community. That they will be distinct. They will not be like any one of those nations that were surrounding them. And central to this were the Ten Commandments. Because through the Ten Commandments, God was laying out what principles they will then need to follow for them to be distinct when they were serving him. We said when God's people were to serve God, we call that they would be worshippers. And hence then from Exodus 21, from verse 2, then God from the Ten Commandments starts outlining regulations or commands through which that the people of Israel would then be able to demonstrate their distinctiveness. And we said these regulations are those that is God, when God gives them, he gives them as scenarios, but in a sense, this is what is called case law. That when as, as and when that they live, one, live amongst one another and with one another, when some of these scenarios pan out, this is how then they would know how to deal with them. 
like in any court, the court always needs to go back to the case law for precedent. Therefore, what God did was to set down all the, the precedents that will then be clear to the children of Israel in how then they can live amongst one another. Last week, we ended off about how God, in verse chapter 22, verse 31, God outlined and said to them, for these people, as his people, they are to be known and to be called as holy. Now in chapter 23, and I will read it today because it's not a long text. Read with me. It says, you shall not spread a false report. You shall not join hands with the wicked man to be a malicious witness. You shall not fall in with the many to do evil. Nor shall you bear witness in a lawsuit siding with the many so as to pervert justice. Nor shall you be partial to a poor man in his lawsuit. If you meet an enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall bring it back to him. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying down under its burden, you shall refrain from leaving him with it. You shall rescue it with him. You shall not pervert the justice due to, a poor, to, to your poor in his lawsuit. Keep far from a false charge and do not kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not acquit the wicked. And you shall take no bribe, for a bribe blinds the clear-sighted and subverts the cause of those who are in the right. Verse 9, you shall not suppress a sojourner. You know the heart of a sojourner, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. For six years you shall sow your land and gather in, it, in its yield. But the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, that the poor of your people may eat, and what they leave the best of the field may eat. You shall do likewise with the vineyard, and with your olive orchard. Six days you shall do your work, but on the seventh day you shall rest, that your ox and your donkey may have rest, and the son of your seventh woman and the alien may be refreshed. Verse 13. Pay attention to all that I have said to you, and make no mention of the names of other gods, nor let it be heard on your lips. Three times in the year you shall keep a fast to me, you shall keep the feast of unleavened bread as I commanded you. You shall eat unleavened bread for seven days at the appointed time in the month of, in the month of Abib. For in it you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty-handed. You shall keep the feast of harvest of the first fruits of your labor, of what you sow in the field. You shall keep the feast of in gathering at the end of the year when you gather in from the field the fruit of your labor. Three times in the year shall all your males appear before the Lord God. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with anything leavened, or let the fat of my feast remain until the morning. The best of the first fruits of your ground you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. We said at the core of all of these commands is God speaking to his people to be his covenant people. And as God's covenant people, he had called them to do nothing else but to be worshipers. We explained that worship is nothing else but how then that people view God. How then that God, how people act in light of who God is. How that God, how people from the inside would be moved towards how to honor God. But we said also, worship is not done in isolation. Worship is seen even when people live amongst one another daily. In, chapters, in chapter what I've just read now, in verses 1 to verses 19, all that we are seeing that God is speaking to the children of Israel. And as he speaks to them as worshippers, he says, every one of the children of Israel as worshippers are to be aligned with him in his character. 
If you are going to be a worshiper, your character must reflect God's character. And what we are seeing from verses 1 to 9, we are seeing that God says those who are worshipers have to act faithfully. They are to act truthfully. He says they are not to be those who distort justice. So in verses 1 to 9, this is how, it, first they, had learned they, had, they must know that as worshippers, they must be truthful. In verses 4 and 5, they must be just. In verses 6 to 9, they are no, there has to be no miscarriage of justice. But also now from verses 10, God says, as worshippers, there are to be those who understand that their work is regulated. As worshippers also, that even their regulation time is regulated. That is from verses 10 to verses 15. Or verse 15, yeah, 16. And uh, finally, God says, when they then are worshippers, there's a certain way that they have to bring a sacrifice to him. With that said, let's look at the first point where God says in chapters, in verses 1 to 9, where God outlines then how justice has to be seen amongst them. Look, he says, you shall not give a false report. This is one of the first requirements. God says, when, you, when the children of Israel were to live amongst each other, they were not to speak falsehoods. They were not to tarnish anyone's character. They were not to tarnish anyone's name. And that word, a falsehood, it means nothing else but something that is empty, something that is vain. Though vain and empty, these words, when they are spoken, they bring destruction. So it is not just mere words. These are words aimed at bringing down someone's reputation or character or his name. So God was saying to them, when they are living amongst each other, they must speak the truth. And in speaking the truth, they must do so to protect the integrity of another. Recall? We looked at this in Exodus 20, verses 16. This is how then that God looks and says, I then out after I've outlined the principle, this is then how you ought to live. When you are speaking falsehoods, is when you are doing what? You are lying. God says you do not lie. Look at the second requirement. He says, and then also, do not join hands with a wicked person to be a malicious witness. So God is saying to the children of Israel, as you are coming together, they must refrain from being teammates or joining forces with those who are unrighteous or anyone who is evil to purposefully slander somebody's character. So God is saying he is demanded that no da damage be done to anyone's good character. Because God says when you do so, he says, this is an injustice. You are muddying. You know, you're taking mud and you're throwing it against somebody's name and character. After you've done that, they've got no name. And you've done so maliciously. And I remember I've said this. We said, I said, if you're not careful about protecting your name, because that's the most important thing that you have. More than how much money that you have, your name is the most precious commodity that you have. So God is saying, they know because your name is who you are as a character. Your name is also what you do. So God says, do not do that. Those in a covenant community were to refrain from joining with anyone who has a semblance of wickedness for destroying another person's name. I'm saying 
selling up somebody else's name or character is the first smell test that anyone needs to know about righteousness. If you want to put a smell test, it's about what are you saying about people. So he says, no goes in a sense. Don't join with others speaking about other people. And also look at verse 2. He says, you shall not follow the crowd in doing evil, nor shall you justify in a dispute so as to join together with the crowd in order to pervert justice. This is another proscription. I always need to remind people, when I'm saying a proscription, I'm not saying prescription. Proscription is something that is forbidden. Prescription is something that is forbidden in the positive. If it's a pros, it's when it's something is forbidden, it says, do not do it. So God says, this is my demand. He says, do not join others together in increasing the number of wickedness. He says, in addition, do not render yourself a witness in contestation and in conflicts. By doing it how? Look at the manner. By joining together with the crowd, saying, don't bend together with the multitude in seeking to skewer the truth. For those who know at school, you know that, right? People will join together in gangs. Or they'll go together just as boys only or as girls only. And then they will go around and because they do not like so and so, then they will bend together and to sully their reputation. God says don't do that. If you know the truth, protect the innocent. God says in, when you are doing so, you are perverting justice. God says, in, in a sense, is when you are doing so, it's a perversion of his character. And you, what are you doing? You are also perverting someone's individual's right to have a good name. Remember, this is their right. The only time that you are not to have a good name, it is when you yourself have destroyed your name. So nobody else must join them. But observe with me, when we are joining together with the crowd in order to pervert justice, God was saying to them, you can still join the crowds by keeping quiet. Where you choose to say, me, I won't get involved. It's none of my indar. But that's also, by you not acting, you are actually acting. No, I don't want to be that. Being passive is also part of joining the crowd. But observe also, Bazalwan, he says again, furthermore, do not show favor to a poor person. So he's because somebody is, has got no economic means, God says, don't join them in the perversion of justice. This is at a time we come from that time. He says, do not even be biased. Do not even be partial to the poor or the marginalized in any conflict. All that people are always to be, if you are to be part of the covenant community, God says you always stick and air and walk on the side of justice. So in a sense, God is saying, justice should not favor anyone based on an extrinsic value. God is not saying you deserve justice because you are poor or you deserve justice. He says justice, that's why ladies, justice must always be what? Blind. And must always have a scale. This scale is not swayed by what is in front of them. We can make a quick example. If you're living at home, sometimes people think that because they have a certain gender, then justice must always go only according to their. And how do they? 
I said, there's a young man looking at me. Yeah. We live in homes where suddenly maybe it might be the only guy, it might be the only girl in the home. And then when they have done wrong, and then because they'll come to their parents and give their parents that type of look so that justice can come to them. Or sometimes, we know how that is. People use tears to want to sway justice in their favor. God says, if you are showing favor to a poor person, he says, this is a superficial and a deplorable means that people hard to live amongst themselves. So what God is actually saying, verses 1 to 3, says, honesty is still the best medicine. What does it say in the New Testament? Speak the truth. Speak the truth, however, in love. And speaking truth means I sometimes I need to tell you what you don't want to hear. But that's what true love is. So when God says in verses 1 to 3, he says, speak the truth too and also about others. He says, protect their integrity for the health and the flourishing of the covenant community. This is how then Israel as a family would be able to live and work together. Because anytime any relationship, there is no truth in that relationship, that relationship definitely will flounder. Because nobody wants to live with anyone who is deceitful. Or one who, after you have told them, they become what? A tell-bearer. They speak things behind your back. God says if we do so, we are immoral. And says this immorality can also be seen when we are lying using numbers. What is the one thing? Truth is not made up by numbers. Here's the principle. Again, truth is not made up on an extrinsic thing. Doesn't matter whether you are poor or you are rich, you don't, cannot make up truth. Truth is independent of where we are financially. So God is saying, there is no democracy in tarnishing any individual's name. God is saying the majority's view is not final since the individual has a right given to them by God. There's multiple examples. We can use one. The man called Jesus Christ, when he has to die, they have to bring in liars to tarnish his character. God says everyone from birth has a right to but observe something here in verses 4 to 5. God wants to speak to people. He then says, if you encounter your enemies also, his donkey wandering away, you must return to him. God says, in Israel, in circumstances where even the one who is unfavorable towards you, unfavorably disposed towards you, and you know that this person is about to experience your loss, God told them, you cannot walk away. But look at the consequence, because he gave you the condition, if look at the consequence, then you must return it to him. God says, you must act decisively to prevent the loss by returning it. And because it is a demand, it says, it is not optional. Look at another condition. If you see the donkey of one who hates you, this person, God says in Israel, you they detest you. They can't stand your guts in our language. And what do you see? You see their donkey. It's lying helplessly under its load. 
and you stand with the consequences. This. You shall not live with helpless for its owner. You must arrange the loan with them. God says there's an expectation for you to help even this one who hates you. God says you must give them assistance. Help them to relieve the load that is upon us, upon them. You can't say, God was saying to the children, you can't plead in capacity because of the other person's sentiments towards you. You have to act differently because you know a different God, because his character is different. God was saying kindness or mercy is owed to all despite their disposition towards you. But God is saying there is no hate by association. You can't hate the donkey because of that. I recall in the old days someone, I can't remember, saying they grew up in the rural areas or something. And then, uh, was it the brother? Or someone, oh yeah, they come from different families. And then somewhere, somewhere, the aunt of this one did something to the aunt of the other one. And when the children go to school, they were getting a beating. That's what I'm saying in the old days. Because not these days, there's no corporal punishment. These children got a beating all the time because so and so's aunt did this to so and so's. So God says, no association of guilt. It is demanded that justice be shown. What God is saying in verses 4 to 5, he says, justice is not partisan. Justice does not wear colors. Justice does not wear nationality. Justice does not wear age. Justice does not wear gender. God is saying, even injustice itself cannot be given according to our perceived or accepted tribal lines. We become unjust because so and so wear certain church colors, or they don't go to a certain color, church. God says, injustice can also still be done because of color or even ethnicity. So in a sense, what the text also says, God says, calamity is not a cause for anyone to be gleeful when others go through difficulties. Oh, I didn't say problem. It says, calamity is not a cause for glee in the covenant community. When others are going through difficult times, you cannot find that to be a joyous occasion. Because what God is saying, worship in its outworking is still reliant on grace to penetrate through different relationships. Where grace is known, grace, where worship is seen and done, grace must be the natural outflow. That's what a worshiper does. That's why then it must translate that justice must not be discriminatory. So what have we seen? If worship is essentially about truthfulness and honesty and fairness, and also by overlooking economic status, God says also, if you are going to be worshippers, there mustn't be perjury or lying about another one by acquitting the guilty. So in a sense now, God says the covenant community must deal with the miscarriage of justice. Look at verse 6. You shall not prevent the justice due to the needy brother in his dispute. God is saying this is a requirement when there is a dispute or a conflict that Israel as a covenant community was not to deny the poor because exactly because they are poor. In a day and age, the people who have access to justice are two. You must be very rich or very poor. 
in between, they will take everything from you for you to get justice. If you have a house, they'll sell your house. If you have a car, they'll sell your car so that you can pay for the legal fees. Because pro bono is only given to those who are poor. So God says, even if you know that someone has got no material resources, they must still receive justice. Because Lady Justice must be blind. Look at the second one, it says, keep far from a false charge and do not kill the innocent or the righteous. This time, this is not a proscription, this is a prescription. God says, drive a distance between yourself and anyone whose word is false or who gives a false charge. In the original, the emphasis is on the false charge. That's why it's called perjury. You're standing and you're raising your hand and you say, I noticed or saw this. You are lying. There's such a case in the, in the Old Testament. A man called Naboth. There's a king and a queen. The queen is called Jezebel. Jezebel and the king come together because they are looking and they're seeking for Naboth's vineyard in the book of Kings. Jezebel then goes and he seeks two witnesses who then lie against Naboth. And Naboth is killed. And after Naboth is killed, he's killed for the sake of his vineyard. And then when the, when the queen comes back, finds the king in his bedroom, sulking, and then he says to him, wake up, go we'll get the field because it's been given. God judges both of them. See also, he says, do not even kill the innocent or the righteous. Do not take the life of an innocent or the upright who have committed no offense by justifying even the loss. Because this is an injustice, this is a miscarriage of justice. Don't do that. God was telling you that. Look at the motivation. He gives you the motivation. Why? For I will not acquit the guilty. God says there is an ultimate judge of all and it's himself. He is the final judge behind every one of the truth. Whenever the truth is not spoken, he is the final arbiter. He will prove people innocent and he won't condemn the guilty. God says, the one who puts their hand on the scale to sway justice will pay for it. They will be held liable ultimately. God says, so that one message, I will surely do it. He says, Israel had to know conclusively that that will happen. He goes now to another, so it says, you shall not take a bribe in a South African language, that's the cold ring law. You know the cold ring? You know the cold ring law? The cold ring law? It's also back then, eh? Well, they, they stop you, they say, give us some cauldron. Yeah. God says, in the covenant community, the cauldron law does not work. He says, don't take it. Do not take or even receive a bribe. No envelope. Because a bribe is nothing else but a backhander. In the original, it is a present or a reward given in exchange for a favor to sway a decision in a certain way. In a certain way. That's what a bribe is. You are giving a present to influence a decision to a predetermined path of a giver. So it's called a brown envelope. I think I told you about this guy that we grew up with. And the last time I saw him, um, when I saw him, he said, man, I don't even have a car because I got a tender after getting a tender. Mr. 10% came and said I must give you 10%. After he had given the 10%, he still had to deliver. And in some of these tenders, your margins are very, very 
So think about it. Even if they give you a 10 million rand tender, it's not 10 million rand because you put in and priced in and you put in a million rand as your profit margin. So if Mr. 10% comes and says, I need my 10%, it means you are doing everything for free. So when I sell this man, he had no car, couldn't buy tires, and he's, he was in the northwest driving up and down Joburg or Hauke, ended up with nothing. Ended up as a truck driver rather than a truck driver. But what did he do? He was a willing participant. <coughs> because Mr. 10% says, Give me, I'll give you this, and you give me 10%. But it gives you motivation, look at why. For a bright, blinds the clear sighted and subverts the cost of the just. God says, when you give a tender, when a tender is received, or a, not a bride is received, it says, it shuts their eyes. In a sense, it says, their eyes are opposified. It means it clouds or acts like a cataract on the eyes. That's what a bride does. In addition, it also overthrows or subverts the words of the righteous, according to Deuteronomy 6 19. Even the righteous, when they give and accept bribes, their words become skews. God says, This is unjust. It is a wickedness because it does not hold what is right, what is just, and what is fair. We are in Deuteronomy 23. We are in verse 9. Oh, sorry, Exodus 23. We are in verse 9. Join us with your Bibles. It says in verse 9, You shall not oppress a stranger. We said last week, a stranger is a foreigner who was living amongst Israel. He says, they, are, they were not to be crushed. They were not to be mistreated. Put a 9 be. He gives you the reason why. Since you yourself know the feelings of a stranger, for you were also strangers in the land of Egypt. God says Israel in their previous journey in Egypt was to serve as a warning or even as an encouragement to act righteously, to act rightly. In a sense, God is saying this is a warning that's had to stem from what their own experiences were in the past. So they were to know what God's heart was to be like when it came to the mistreatment of strangers. God expected that they had to show and demonstrate love to foreigners according to Deuteronomy 10 19. So, this law, in a sense, unlike 22 21, this was a legal requirement. Do you think that that's where security is? How much money you have? Or indeed, we've seen them. So God is saying to them, will their identity be on wealth or will their identity be based on God's word? Will they believe God to do what God says? God is saying if they are going to be worshippers, would they as worshippers decline God's demand for when and how they must work? Because God says, I even regulate how you must work. But we can also keenly observe from the text, verse alive, that even those who are worshippers should not be struggling after they have kept the Sabbath year. They should then not struggle about keeping the Sabbath day, right? But we are saying, if indeed, that life was to be lived ideally. Because what did we learn? We learned this morning that full faith must produce obedience. True faith is obedience. Mm -hmm. And what is it obedient to? To God's word and nothing else. Now look at verse 13. In between, God says, Now concerning everything which I have said to you, be careful. 
In verse 13, God gives them three things. He says, they must be careful and they must not mention the name of other gods. Look at the third thing. And do not let it be heard from your mouth. Three things. God says he has a warning to you. He has a demand. And what is the demand? Do not even make the mention of other gods. God is saying, you know that there is one God. Monotheism is the ringer amongst you. Do not be like all the other surrounding nations. There is only one God. Israel was to entertain monotheism as the only true religion or the true faith. So God is saying they are to be fastidious in their worship. No room for compromise. But in between, look at again now what does he do? In between them, knowing as a covenant community that there is only one God and it mustn't even be spoken of, not even in their mouth. Then he turns and he says, worship must also, their worship types must be regulated. Look at the text. Verse 14, he says, three times a year, you shall celebrate a feast to me. God says, on three occasions, every year, you must and you shall depend what three times a year means. It has to be a three feet, meaning they must go on a pilgrimage. You live where you are, live where you are, and you go to the appointed place where you must go and worship. And he says, you shall celebrate a feast to me. This is a demand. God says, they must go have a celebration. They must go and celebrate God at the appointed place. God says, your worship times to Israel are also given. I wish we had time, I don't have time. We'll look at it during the week. Because then God observes further in Deuteronomy 6.16, clarifies what these times are. Even in Exodus 24, 23 to 24. But what God also gave was an assurance in Deuteronomy also. In Exodus to say, look, when you are away, here's my promise. I will protect your land. And if your children and your wives are left behind, I will protect them too. God says, in a sense, why then must they live together? Why then must the males live and go worship God? Because they're saying, at head, at heart, they need to celebrate the living. That you are living in a certain area, whether it's in the south or in the west, you all come together because you were all saved together. He's saying there are a single community. And then he goes on to explain. Look at the explanation of the three feasts. He says, keep the feast of unleavened bread. We looked at it this morning. This is what Nati read in, in Luke 22. There it's called the Passover. But before you get the feast of unleavened bread, they might have to first keep the Passover. This is where the lamb is slain. And he says, how long? They are to keep it for seven days. They are not to eat unleavened bread. So it tells them even how long that it is stipulated that how long they are not to consume the bread that is leavened. And he gives you the message as I commanded you previously in Exodus chapter 2 verses 40 to 20. We looked at this. So when God has as I commanded you, what is he saying? The repetition. God says, I'm not telling you. Remember when God repeats something, it's for what? Emphasis. And he says, at the appointed time in the month of Ab Abib. So he says, even then, even the appointment calendar is the same. That what Abib means to the first harvest. It's appointed somewhere around April, March, April. Because the calendar of Israel this time always started with what? With the Passover. Remember, we started this. He said they became a nation when God brought them out. And from that time, when God redeemed them, that was their new identity and their new year. 
and it gives you the motivation why why must he keep this? So he says in the in the month you came out of Egypt, and no one is to appear to me empty-handed. Remember, recollect you were delivered from Egypt, and no one is to appear empty-handed. Why could they not appear empty-handed? Why could any man come into the appointed place and come empty-handed? Because along in the previous verses, because what they have been working. They had been given access to land. So everybody had to bring something. And then they had the third feast. And you shall keep the feast of harvest, the feast of the labors. And now you are to, from sowing the field. Also the feast of the ingathering. Three feasts. But in a sense, Bazalon, I hope you realize something here. Once God regulated their worship times, all it means that they are of Israel's worship times were particular. Another one I like in Hamilton, he says, it helps us in how we ought to think about work and worship. He says the following: Israel had to know that you did not you, that you did not you did not your work, your work was not to control you. Work must not control worship, and worship cannot control work. You must do deal, you must do both. You must still work and worship. And <laughs> you must still worship without working. That's the distinction. Work cannot control worship. And worship cannot control work. Doesn't that help you? He further says, work does not displace worship and neither does worship displace work. In a sense, God was saying to this covenant community, they had to know that God was the only one who could disrupt their lives. God's word must be disruptive in their lives in how then they are to look at God as a covenant community. You have said this sometimes happens in churches where people like, hey pastor, I will not be seeing you. Oh, what happened? You have taken a job in Cape Town. You go to Cape Town, yes, I'm going to Cape Town, I received an offer and I'm going down. Oh, okay. What church are you going to? No, I don't know. I'll see when I get there. I've always loved Cape Town. I love being by the sea. Oh, I love Devon. You know, I'll be on holiday every week. You know, people who stay in Devon sometimes never go to the sea. <laughs> the point I was making is, God was saying he even regulates they are worship times. Look at the last one. God speaks to them. Oh, verse 17, he told them, I told you three times a year, all the men shall appear. Those who must go to the designated place to go and worship were to be male. Why male? Because they are the ones who must attend. It says, those who do not attend as male, it is not tolerated. But why not women? Because there could be some things that are stopping the women. Remember Hannah in the book of First Samuel? There's a reason why she didn't go. Because she had just had a baby. So women would also not go. But it was optional. But for men, worship on those three occasions was demanded. But let's look at the final one. How then indeed that God says even worship itself, when they sacrifice, their worship must be sacrificial. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with unleavened bread. Nor is the fat of my feast to remain overnight. God says, when they come and offer a sacrifice, there must not be leaven in it. No yeast. And God says, even the feast, the fat of my feast, see, it, it, it belongs to him, must not remain overnight until morning. The fat was the very best. So look at between verses 18 and 19. You shall bring the choice food of your soil into the house of God. God was saying, here's another prescription. In the original, it goes back to the first fruit itself. It speaks about the first, first fruits. That's what it says. So between the fat and the first fruit, God was saying, those who are worshippers need to be generous in their people. He says, 
We are not to scream on anything, but that you have generous generosity. Nothing but the finest offerings must be given to God. The very best. That's why when, when David is asked about if he has to buy a, a place for Aroa so that he can go and build an altar, that he says, I shall not offer anything to God that doesn't cost me anything. That's why I'm also not in the favor of giving our kids money so that they can offer because they never work for the money. They're just their parties. Let them work, let them wash their dishes, let them pay their children the fire so that they can offer their money and give them 10 grand and let them see what they're going to do with the 10 grand. Whether they offer the 10 grand or will they decide to chow on it? Because that's the time for you to teach them what they are thinking. Oh, sorry, I was also a child. I think I told you. When my brother and I, he's also a good thing, Zawari now, he must remind me. We used to go to a church in a different area. They'll give us train fare, they'll give us offering. Ah, you know, when you get to the train station, the first thing we do, we travel offering, right? Either we travel this or we travel mine, and then we go to church. The church was in a different location, and we'll go to my grandma, my grandmother would give us food, and on our way back, catch the train, then we travel this night. And come home at the church. Nobody asks us what we do with the offer. They're expecting for us to put it here. No, we shall it along the way. But God says if they're giving, they have to give generously. And then finally, he says, You are not to boil a young goat in the milk of his mother. It's another prescription. This is one of the most difficult verses in the Bible, by the way. There's multiple ways that people are thinking about it. People are thinking it's about humanity, that people must be humane. There's different ideas. But I like one. The recent Hamilton says, when, when a kid is boiled in his mother's milk, he says, they are not to cook meat from whence the meat got its warm. That's how we do it. So, Basalani, let's go to this text. I want you to realize something. When he says to them, we looked at it the other day, when God says they are not to bring in leavened bread, God says, when they are given their sacrificial offering and their celebration, they need to be reminded again as an ongoing, what does leaven mean? What does love does he stand for? Sin. So God is saying, when Paul looks at this text in 1 Corinthians 5, 6 and 7, he says, everyone in the covenant community needs to know that sin is a factor that you need to take care of in your ongoing life of celebration with God. Take care of sin. The one thing that is going to bring it down is your sin. Don't even give room for it. He says, when you have a new identity, your greatest enemy is sin and your flesh. And God demands that you do so. And I want to close. Look at this. I'm saying, look at the text summary. If I look at verses 1 to 19, this is my summary. Moses says, he conveys that worship in the covenant community must reflect God's character. It has to be truthful. It has to be fair. It has to be honest without being partial. Worship also regulates walk and worship time and the covenant community sacrifices. We'll get into you on Thursday. Or you watch the video. Let me repeat it again. Moses conveys that worship in the covenant community must reflect God's character. It must be truthful, it must be fair, it must be honest without being passion. Worship also regulates work and worship time and the covenant community sacrifices. That's my summary of the text. And I close by saying that the one worship is about drawing close to God. That's what worship is. So in all these regulations, God says, you know what true morality is. You know how to be living with me. You know how to draw towards me. And only those with a living relationship with him can enjoy such fellowship with God. Only those who have a living relationship through Christ can be drawn towards him. 
And because they are drawn to God, it also deals with their intra covenantal community. How they live amongst each other. Here are some thoughts that I'm taking from, from the text about worship. Worship is needed for there to be a restored covenant. For you to know God, God must restore you to his covenant. <coughs> because without your sins were forgiven, you're not part of the covenant. Israel had been redeemed by God before they could be given this laws. He said, before a covenant comes, a relationship precedes a covenant. So if you're going to want to have a covenant with God, you must have a relationship with him. The only one who brings a covenant is Christ. He alone is the one who brings his the last. We're talking about it this morning. That he is the Passover lamb that was slain before the foundation of the earth. And the New Testament says, even when you look at the feasts, what is the final feast? Is that feast of in gathering, the feast of booths? What does it represent in the New Testament? It's what? It's the new church in chapter 10, that's chapter 10. Because that came seven weeks after Passover. What do we call it? Pentecost. Church came through Pentecost. And that's why then you need to be restored to God to become part of the covenant community. You can't come to your own strength. And those who have a restored covenant relationship with God have their sins forgiven. You must have your sins forgiven for you to come into the covenant community. It is not by how many times you go to church, how many times you have said, how many times you have read the Bible. God must wash your sins in your heart. But not only this, those who have been saved, they must demonstrate that this relationship with God is their most prized relationship. There is no other relationship that is worthy than a relationship that is restored through the covenant with God. This is the most prized relationship. And how do you demonstrate it? You live righteously because you're part of the covenant community. All that you are spilling at is righteous living. If you know how to live right, this is what God is saying. Here's another thing. Worship makes those in a covenant relationship to value grace that overcomes their weaknesses. Because it is only in their worship that you get to realize that God, through his grace, is the one who must restore you and restore even some of the weaknesses that you don't know how weak you are until you know God's grace. And your greatest witness is your sin. That's why you need grace. You don't work for it. Offered freely on the cross through Jesus Christ. That's why you must come to receive his grace by faith. You must come by faith. Nothing else. Nothing works. I'm saying worship devalues possession and since God owns all things, worship must become generous to him and to God. That's what worship must be. Once God has saved you, he said, what do you do? You open your wallet. You open your purse. Because everything about you, if he saved your life, what does he own in your life? He owns everything. I want to thank you, Father, this morning. I want to thank you for your goodness. I want to thank you for your grace. That it is only through your grace that you become worshippers. Worshippers from the heart. Not to extend us, able to give justice, fairness, and to everyone, living in display of your character, God. And for this, we want to thank you. May you alone be glorified. It's in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.